Hi, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Southern. I'm from Mississippi, so I'm going to say that again. Good morning, everyone. On behalf of the Millennials Initiative, I want to warmly welcome y'all to New America and today's event, the Millennial Public Policy Symposium, New Voices and Ideas on Care, Community, Technology, and Civic Engagement. My name is Melody Frierson, and I have the pleasure of serving as not only the project manager of the Millennial Public Policy Fellowship, but also as today's, if you need anything, let me help you, representative. Today's symposium is the result of months of hard work and planning from our fellows and support from colleagues across our organization. To give a tiny bit of background, one year ago, we received nearly 500 applications from young people across the country and around the world seeking to be a part of the Millennial Public Policy Fellowship Program. Our goals for the fellowship was to bring together a truly diverse cohort of young folks to work within New America's renowned policy programs and also, explain, and also expand understandings of what a think tank looks like and how it operates. Our 10 Millennial Fellows here in this room today arrived at New America in late August 2017 and immediately impacted the organization and their respective programs. We are indebted to our New America colleagues in Better Life Lab, family-centered social policy, education policy program, political reform, resource security, public interest technology, the Cybersecurity Initiative, and the Open Technology Institute, as well as our friends at the Institute for Policy Studies and the Poor People's Campaign for challenging, mentoring, and lifting up our millennial fellows. Before I hand things over to our next member of the welcoming committee, I want to do a quick bit of housekeeping. Today's event will be live streamed, and we welcome folks in this room and those watching from elsewhere to join us in conversation on Twitter with the hashtag Millennial Public Policy. Don't forget the second end in millennial is tricky. All of, our all of today's sessions will take place in this room, our main event space. Restrooms are located outside and towards the front desk. Should you want to connect to Wi-Fi, the information is located within the front page of your program. Speaking of programs, in it you'll find today's schedule, short bios on all of our participants today, descriptions of each Millennial Fellows policy research projects, and excerpts from our blog, The Direct Message. Once we felt that we've welcomed y'all sufficiently, we'll move right into our four distinct sessions designed by the Millennial Fellows new perspectives on communities of care, the promises and perils of technology and big data, policy engagement and political activism, and to round out the day, expanding the table, intergenerational activism and policy change. In addition to engaging y'all through these sessions, we hope to use our breaks, lunch, and closing reception to connect with each of you and have deeper connect conversations on the important and timely issues discussed today. This symposium and its fellowship program would not be possible without the generous support of the City Foundation. Thank you for being committed to helping young people build an entrepreneurial mindset, acquire leadership, financial and workplace skills, and begin to engage in the formal economy through a first job. With all of that said, please join me in welcoming City Foundation Program Officer Julie Hodgson to the stage. Good morning, everyone. Um, it's great to be here with you today. Thank you, Melody, for that warm welcome. I'm Julie Hodson. I'm a program officer at the City Foundation, and I oversee a lot of our youth programming in the United States. And today's event is exciting for many, many reasons. Um, but for those of us who've kind of worked behind the scenes, I would say it's especially exciting because it's really the culmination of a two-year effort uh, led by New America with support from the City Foundation to invest in future policy leaders and to identify and source a new set of policy ideas. Um, the City Foundation partnered with New America in 2016, I believe, um, to create the Millennial Public Policy Fellowship Initiative which complements our Pathways to Progress initiative. Um, Pathways to Progress, for those of you who don't know, is the City Foundation's philanthropic commitment to support programs that um, 
help young people connect to job training programs and career readiness opportunities. Um, it's a $100 million philanthropic commitment, um, connecting 500,000 youth to those types of opportunities by 2020. And so the Millennial Public Policy Fellowship was designed to identify um, a diverse set of young people who could engage in a healthy, robust public policy discourse, um, as well as to support their professional development as critical thinkers, as policy entrepreneurs, um, and really just as leaders. And I think kind of what the foundation found so unique about this is that it was giving a platform to millennials um, to identify solutions to some of the country's most challenging issues. Um, and, you know, I think it makes a lot of sense, especially for millennials and the, the issues that their generation is facing, that we would engage them in helping us come up with the answers um, since they're so close to these issues. And I will tell you, having met with the, the fellows, they are a remarkable group. Uh, I was humbled, to say the least, by their intelligence. They're extremely thoughtful. Um, they're engaged in some really interesting conversations, a lot of which we'll hear today. And I'm just thrilled to be here, thrilled to listen. Um, I think um, they have a lot to, to tell us, and I think that a lot of the solutions you know, are within them, and i um, really excited to hear the conversation. So with that, I want to thank them, because they're really kind of the driving force behind all of this for all of their effort and for embracing the fellowship. I mean, I think they've embraced it um, beyond our expectations over the last eight months. And then, of course, our partners at New America have been great in helping us bring this vision to life. So thank you for hosting us and for all of your work. And with that, I believe I will turn it over to Tyra, who's going to give another welcome. So thank you. Good morning, everyone. My name is Tyra Mariani, and I am the executive vice president here at New America. As I was looking at the lineup, I did kind of feel like the welcome committee. So <laughs> for the third time, I will say welcome, and particularly uh, or a special welcome to those of you that are, are visiting us from externally. Uh, I am really, really excited about the symposium that's happening today. As I was reflecting on the day and meetings that I had yesterday as well as today, I was reminded that New America was started almost 20 years ago by four individuals who were of millennial age. They were roughly young 30-somethings. And it is quite remarkable to, to both think about where the organization is now and actually in our leadership team meeting yesterday, we were starting to just recall some of the accomplishments over the 20 years. And so it feels really fitting that we're having this conversation today, both in the context in which we sit of what's happening in our country and our world, but also in the context of an organization that is about to celebrate 20 years in existence. And so I am personally excited, not only because of the millennial cohort that I've engaged with, but also the millennials in general that in the room. For those of you that aren't familiar, New America is actually comprised of majority 20 and 30 somethings. In fact, 46% of our almost 200 person organization is made up of people that are 20 something years in age. And as an organization, we deeply, deeply believe in new voices, new ideas, and new tools. And uh, I know that today's conversation will be no departure whatsoever from that. And I wondered what would come to fruition, what seeds would be planted, what would bear fruit that we will point back to today's conversation and say, it started here. There was an interesting idea that happened here among the millennials, as well as just an intergenerational conversation, which is so, so very critical that it's because it started here that we can say that it bore fruit um, because of what happened today. So with that in mind, I will close with Reed's closing line and his letter, which is, let's get on with the program. <laughs> Have a great day. OK, uh, I'm Reed Kramer. I'm the director of the Millennials Initiative here at New America. And I'm, I guess I don't have to welcome you. Um, but I can thank you for being here uh, at this symposium. And, and with the support of many uh, colleagues here at New America, this program's been organized, the symposium's been or organized 
to facilitate a, a set of dynamic uh, policy conversations. And uh, I'd actually like to thank Melody uh, Frierson, um, who really is the extremely able manager of this project. Um, and also, thank you for your work and our events and communications team who have helped um, get us uh, to this day. And, and really, uh, leadership of New America has been extremely supportive and a lot of our colleagues in the, in the policy program. So it's been a pleasure to work with everybody and it really has been um, a group effort. Um, I'm extremely grateful uh, for Julie and her colleagues at the City Foundation, um, both for their financial support of this endeavor, this work, but also their, their real engagement around um, promoting pathways to progress for uh, a diverse set of opportunity youth uh, in the country, across the country, and also around the world. Um, it's very important work, and they've really been leaders in this field, and it's, it's, it's been um, you know, really grateful uh, to engage with them. So the, the initiative was created to acknowledge that today's youth really are coming of age in a time of uncertainty. And there's a growing disconnect between the experience that they're, they're living um, and the prevailing public policy that um, is, is either providing support or not providing support. And there's, there's a misalignment between the social and economic conditions, um, and it's creating a precariousness that is undermining the potential of an entire uh, generation. So there is an imperative to um, develop a new set of ideas that can meet the moment, that can create new pathways uh, forward and ladders uh, uh, upward for the rising generations. And that was the thinking behind creating the, the fellowship uh, opportunity. Um, good policy should be aligned with prevailing attitudes and behaviors. Um, and if that's true, then we need the engagement of those impacted to help drive the ideas generation process. Um, and as Melody said, we you know, designed the fellowship to identify this remarkable cohort of individuals who could contribute uh, constructively to policy conversations, and then also to support their growth and their, their professional development. So it really is, um, you'll see them uh, today, they've organized uh, this session. Uh, th their work is available on our blog, The DM, which is on our uh, website. Uh, direct message for any of the non-millennials in the room. Um, and uh, there's also selected pieces uh, of each of them in, in the symposium program. They've all been embedded in the different programs across the organization, and uh, working together, they've organized uh, the symposium, really with the goals of, of elevating new voices and, and perspectives, uh, addressing contemporary policy issues um, in, in cross-cutting ways. You know, they're all working on different things, so we would come together as a group and bring some really unique um, yeah, perspectives to, to engage with, with, with each other. And then to begin to identify what some potential solutions uh, could be to some of the most consequential issues of our time. Um, and before we, we dig in further, I did want to consider what some of the limits and, and the, um, the value uh, are in, in using a generational lens, and then offer some kind of foundational data to ground our conversation. So, the, the caveat to begin with is that defining and naming a generation is, is, is not um, a science. Uh, it's really more of an art. Um, and we have to figure out how it can be helpful and, and where it can um, obfuscate insight. Uh, the, the Pew Research Center has been really helpful in, in kind of identifying a data-driven approach. So I've relied on a lot of their analysis. Um, they define uh, millennials as those born between 1981 and 1996. So the youngest are 21 and the oldest are 37. And that's obviously a pretty big spread that captures many different aspects of the life course. Um, but it does give us a cohort to work with analytically. And using Pew's definition, we see that millennials are now 22% of the total population, 30% uh, of potential voters, and 38% of working age uh, adults. And they're clearly outpacing boomers uh, more and more every day. Um, and by 2025, 20, uh, they're gonna comprise 75% uh, of the labor force. Um, they, they do share kind of historic and cultural experiences that are distinct from other uh, generations. Um, you can see there were you know, early memories of some confusing 
social disruption uh, with the Oklahoma City bombing, for instance, in 1995, the Columbine shooting in 1999, um, political um, disputes associated with sharpening political polarization with the impeachment of uh, Bill Clinton and his acquittal in 1998. Uh, millennials were between five and 20 when 9-11 occurred, and then they grew up during the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. And certainly for me, the, the, the Great Recession looms large, and particularly its aftermath, which has continued to have uh, an impact. Um, uh, millennials were between the ages of 12 and 27 during the 2008 election when the force of the youth vote helped uh, elect the first black president. And then uh, 2016 was a pretty memorable election as well, a surprising result, uh, to say the least. Um, and, and over the, their li lifetime, I'll also note that a lot of socioeconomic indicators have gotten dramatically better. Um, teen pregnancies down, smoking's down, drinking hard liquor, um, violent crime has had a, 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 a deep, uh, sharp uh, decline during their lifetime. But if we look at the world with kind of generalizations, we do miss some of the diverse experiences. And this generation is actually defined by its diversity. Um, it's the most, most ethnically diverse generation in American history. 44% uh, identify as something other than white, non-Hispanic. Um, minority shares are increasing across the board for, for, for all groups, um, especially Latinx, who 21% um, identify of millennials identify uh, as Latino or Hispanic, and that's up from 9% from uh, for uh, boomers. And given this diversity, uh, we, we really have to be pretty skeptical of claims of universal experiences. Um, um, still, there's some, you know, these are just demographic realities, and it's going to impact society as a whole. We've got older, uh, whiter boomers that are kind of contrasted with millennials who are more diverse, and there's potentially a generational reckoning that uh, could be unfolding that's going to play out in policy uh, debates, this, this cultural gap between the, the older, whiter, uh, society and, and, and the more diverse uh, society. And, and millennials are really serving as this bridge to a much more diverse America. This is going to be the future uh, of the country. And it will remake institutions and will remake uh, the country. Um, and if we acknowledge this diversity, we're also acknowledging that uh, the experience of millennials of color is very distinct and actually quite perilous. Uh, black, Latino, other millennials of color face a number of unique challenges. Um, unemployment is higher, uh, living in poverty is more prevalent, wealth holdings are dramatically lower uh, than for white uh, counterparts, and, and violent crime more, more uh, likely to be experienced, involvement in the criminal justice system. These are some of the issues that we're going to hear about uh, today. Um, but the diversity of the generation really should prompt us to look at where these disparities um, are um, you know, needing to be examined more, more closely, looking for where policy is not responding to current conditions. And, and what are those conditions? Um, th you know, I'm going to just provide a couple of notes here of, of things uh, that um, we can look at. The educational landscape has changed quite dramatically. There are more degrees and credentials, uh, actually tripling since, uh, let's see, tripling since the 1960s, but we've also seen higher tuition and higher student debt. And our education policy program here at New America tracks a lot of these trends um, quite ably. They're, they're producing a lot of great work. They document how students have taken on a lot more debt um, um, as tuition has gone up uh, than their parents did, actually 300% more debt than their parents. And unfortunately, it doesn't always lead to a degree, which uh, can be uh, also pretty debilitating. So this debt and finances generally um, are changing behavior over the life course. Um, uh, we see marriage uh, changing. Millennials are less likely to marry. When they do, they marry older. Having children is less prevalent. The birth rate, uh, not a lot of attention to this in, in our discourse, but it's actually reached a record low five years in a row um, in 2016. Lower, uh, lower birth rate. Since the recession, uh, young adults are half as likely to own homes as young adults were in 1975. So previous generations, homeownership's 
much uh, less. And rents are going up at the same time. So more than uh, in the past, let's see, 15 years, the number of people that are spending more than half of their income on rent has gone up 50%. Um, and this is really through no fault of their own. This is the, the economy that they've uh, inherited. They've come of age in a stagnant wage uh, economy. They're earning 20% less than boomers did at the same uh, stage of life. And let's see, this without, this is the net worth slide. Without the home equity uh, to bolster the balance sheet, uh, younger Americans are significantly behind uh, older generations in terms of wealth accumulation. Uh, the median net worth is, is today 30% below its peak in 2007. Um, but younger families, families headed by someone under the age 35, net worth is 41% lower today than it was in 1995. Uh, and in contrast, uh, households headed by someone 75 years and older, seniors, um, their wealth has risen 32% in the last three years. So there's actually a, a, a millennial wealth gap that's emerging. And it's, it should be quite, quite alarming, given how wealth is so important for, for many aspects of, of stability. Um, and when we combine the millennial wealth gap with the uh, racial wealth gap, which is uh, historic, um, and it endures, and it, it's growing, um, I think this is a, a, a terrible uh, combination. Throughout US history, we've seen how every means of wealth accumulation whether it's access to higher ed, home ownership, access to credit, um, it's been systematically denied to, to minorities. And therefore, we have these kind of net worth disparities uh, that are up there 10 times uh, wealth holdings of white households versus um, African American households in, in recent figures. And so th these are the new economic realities of the country. It's certainly complicating how young people are making decisions about their life, how they're assembling the building blocks of success and making the, the journey up the economic ladder much more uh, difficult. Um, and, and, and financial security has become the aspiration rather than the, the traditional features of the American dream that, that um, um, you know, we, we, we talk about as a society, whether that's you know, family, buying a home, moving into a community, settling down. Um, so that's the, 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 the state of uh, play right now. And, and is this a problem? Uh, is this a chance to respond? I, I think it's both. Um, and, and increasingly, millennials are going to lead shifts in public opinion that are kind of creating opportunities for large-scale policy change. Uh, this, we can look at this in a lot of different ways. As a cohort, they're also they're, they're skeptical of political parties. They, they, they want to be independent, uh, but also they lean liberal. They're, they're open to big ideas. This is the, the spread of those that are, that are voting. So this is, you know, as, as a group, um, they, they, they're open to policy solution and, and big ideas. I think that's the point. The, the meta point I want to make to kind of close here is that all of this matters in a democracy, what people think um, about current affairs and the issues of the day. And the value, there's a value in elevating kind of new generational voices and perspectives in, in a search for uh, policy uh, solutions. Um, so clearly, we've got some challenges in the political moment today. Uh, there's an undermining of norms that I think is making the system of governance uh, much more challenging. It's adding some significant stress points. Um, there's really value in thinking about the long game, about what uh, policies uh, could work at scale over time. And I think we need to be vigilant in looking out for these solutions that can work at scale. We want to observe the world, ask questions, um, search for effective um, and durable policy uh, solutions. So that's the task today. That's the spirit that we're convening this symposium in. Um, we're going to stage a series of conversations that are going to really try to elevate some of these consequential issues of the day. Um, and uh, I'll just review some of the, the themes uh, Quickly, these are the, 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 the featured sessions where we're gonna ask some of these questions. We've got changes in the economy, evolving gender roles, changing expectations of families and employers. So what does this mean for how we care for each other? What does this mean for how we support, care, and educate our diverse populations? What's our collective responsibilities for care? So that the first panel is gonna dig into that. Second, we're gonna navigate looking at how 
Big data and technological innovation has changed the landscape of how we live, and there's promise and peril ahead, which we're gonna uh, explore. How do we balance these rights and social protections? And how do we implement technological solutions that can be transformative? And then third, there's political engagement that's required to make policy change. What's the civic space like? How do we govern it where, where policy and politics meet? What's the role of movement building and advocacy? How do we expand the table to get more, more voices um, in a meaningful exchange looking for effective policy uh, change? So those are the questions today. Um, thanks for being here. Stick with us. And um, we are going to get on with the program. Thank you. Um, so let's have Micah come up and bring on the next session.